Right, so I think let's kick off a very big BA. Good morning and welcome to everybody who's joined us for our 2020 personal tax webinar. Um, and really the, the aim is twofold today during this webinar. The first is just to provide some clarity around your 2020 tax filing season and the processes that, that accompany it and just to, to align your thinking with what needs to be done. And I think more importantly, and, and probably the reason why most of you are here, is to provide you with what we at Burns I could call knowledge nuggets around personal tax planning and personal tax strategy. And really the, the, the main purpose of today is just to, dis, to guide your strategic thinking around your approach to tax. Um, you know, many people take a reactive approach to tax. Um, our approach at Burns Acre is very different. Um, it, you need to have a tax strategy. It involves a lot of planning. And really, the point of today is to provide you with those options that are available to you when planning your personal taxes. So if everybody's ready to, to kick off, I think we will get started. Um, once again, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, this webinar will probably run for about 60 to 75 minutes. Um, and in this time, really, our, our main focus is to provide you with broad-based information to guide your strategic decision-making. And the key word in this phrase being strategic. So tax needs to have a strategic approach and your, your strategy is only, is, has to be underpinned by planning. And the point is, is your, your, you can only plan if you know what options are available to you. So what we're doing today and what we're presenting for you today is really the, the options that are available to you when planning your, your, your tax strategy. Um, the next point is that your individual tax strategies must be finalized with your individual BA account managers. So if you're already an existing BA client and you know who your manager is, we, we really encourage you to engage with your account managers, certainly in finalizing your 2020 tax submissions. But I think more importantly, looking at your tax strategy for the 2021 tax year. We, we're already in full swing. We're halfway through the 2021 tax year. And certainly a lot of the strategies which we implemented at the beginning of the year in line with everything that's happened with COVID, with what's happened in the economy, certainly, in our opinion, will require some sort of realignment to make sure that that strategy is still valid and that the strategy in play is the most tax and cash efficient for you. So please, we really do encourage you to, to engage your, your BA manager. And if you're not a BA, BA client, please feel free to reach out to us either through our info at Burns Acres, where you can contact uh, Brad or myself directly, and we will certainly be able, be able to assist. And just, just some, um, some ground rules. We've placed everybody on mute. Um, it's just to, to keep it tidy and to keep it clean. And really, if anybody has any questions, you're free to raise any questions. You can do it publicly via the Zoom chat. We have our tax team and we have some, some staff who are tax specialists on standby and they will respond to your queries on the zoom chat uh, depending on the influx of of queries and questions we have we, we really will attempt to answer all the questions as best we can i um, mean as comprehensively as we can but please feel free to reach out directly to us after the session if you have any questions that are specific to to your situation or your, your scenario or you require a bit more clarity at the end of the session, we'll also be opening up the floor to some Q&A, um, some live Q&A, um, and really we encourage you to engage with us. Um, these, you know, we aim for these webinars to be interactive because really our aim here is to support you and we can only support you if you interact with us and, and, and present us with the scenarios that you're facing. So please ask loads of questions. Um, guaranteed if, if you're thinking it or you're facing a, a, a bit of a situation, there's more than likely 10 or 15 people that have the same question floating around in their head. So please feel free to engage us. And then for those of you familiar with our webinars, we will make this presentation available after the webinar. And we will also be able to send you a link for the recording. So this is being recorded, it's a live recording, and you can always use it to, to go back um, for reference. So um, let, let's just quickly go through the agenda before I introduce uh, Bradley Woolridge, who's our speaker for today. Um, so firstly, we'll be covering your personal tax strategy. 
um, in line with what I, what I said earlier. And really your personal tax strategy should be in structuring your tax affairs in the most tax efficient manner that ultimately results in you paying the least amount of tax and hopefully leave some money in your bank accounts at the end of the day. And we'll also be running through the SARS processes. We think it's very important that people understand the SARS processes because it, it, it debunks a lot of the, you know, a lot of the myths and you also know what to expect. Um, and this is very relevant for the current tax filing season covering the 2020 tax year. And we'll just be running through those, those processes with you and also through the SARS timelines. So when the season open, when the season closes, so you can plan to get your, your, your documentation ready and we can really finalize your tax returns as soon as possible. We'll also be running through some of the general rules of personal tax, as well as the burns acre processes, um, which I think are, are quite important because if, if burns acre are involved and, and we're, we're looking after your taxes, I think it's, it's really important to understand our internal processes and the level of detail and interrogation that goes into us actually completing your tax return. You know, too many people say, well, I have this lady that does my tax and I send her my stuff once a year. You know, we don't do tax. We have a strategic approach to tax and that's what we're here to discuss today is, is really to, like I said before, guard, you, guard your mindset and guard your approach to tax. It has to be strategic. Uh, we'll then provide you with a list of the documentation that you need to prepare in order to seamlessly go through the tax submission process. Um, and then really we get into the nuts and bolts and why we're here today, which are your, your tips and tricks. Um, and these really are tips and tricks that are available to everybody, um, irrespective of where you are in, in the tax scale, to really um, structure your tax affairs and maximize your tax efficiency. And our goal at the end of the day is not to avoid paying tax. It really is to save you money and using the options that are available out there to save you money to pay the least amount of tax at the end of the day. We'll also be covering multiple payrolls and we'll be moving on to some, some Q&A. So I think if, if everybody's ready to kick off and, and to save some time, I'd like to introduce Bradley Woolridge. Um, Brad is our managing director. He's a chartered accountant and also the managing partner of Burns Aikert. Um, internally within the firm, he's known as the machine and certainly the contents of this, uh, this webinar will indicate why. And he's also our resident man with the plan when it comes to structuring tax affairs. Um, and, you know, he's really the person that, that um, he's the right person you need to be speaking to if you have any issues or, or to, uh, to really give you a, a, a value added approach to structuring your tax. So I think without further ado, Brad, I'm gonna hand over to you and if you can uh, run us through this information pack, please. All right, thanks Al, morning everyone. And it's, it's good to be here. I've woken up in a good mood despite my two year old's birthday yesterday resulting in, in a bit of a late night. So it's nice to have you all. <laughs> I think if we, if we start off on the first slide uh, to set the tone for the day, I want, to know, I want you to know that from a tax perspective and a tax office perspective, tax season gets intense. And um, that look is really sort of how my staff start to feel after a while. And I guess the reason I wanted to have today was to, to start showing everyone and sharing with our clients, uh, you know, what it is that takes us beyond that. Uh, this slide here, what I want everyone to really get today is that as much as I want to be a magician and as much as I look up to Shin Lim and David Copperfield, you know, I'm not magic. I can't just get information and make tax go away. I can't get information and make tax less. That's the most frustrating comment we receive is, you know, here's my tax, make it as little as possible. Well, that's not really my job. My job is to calculate the tax and my, my responsibility is to empower you to have a tax efficient structure and mechanism. So let's start at the very beginning and, and, and talk about planning, because if you don't plan, there's really very little I can do for you. And uh, I can't minimize your tax without a plan. I, I literally can't help you. So planning is everything. The second thing that tax is linked to is documentation. We need to understand that SARS are ultimately our masters and they are the ones that take from us. And the way they take from us is by telling us that they're doing us a favor and they do us that favor by allowing us to claim expenses. But they're only gonna allow you to claim if it's a valid expense or if you have your invoice. So documentation and administration is a critical component of the tax process. And I don't want you to underestimate this because if you plan and if you have detailed documentation, the tax process is relatively simple. So 
that's really where I wanted to start today and have that as a base. Now, in terms of developing a, strat a strategy, I don't want you to have hope. Hope, hope. hope is for a different context. Hope is for sports. Hope is for politics. Hope is not for tax planning. You, you cannot hope that your tax is going to be low. And I'm going to take you through exactly how and why we can achieve that. So the first thing we need to understand is what is your income? And really the simple view I take of income is if you earn it, SARS want a piece of it. So pretty much anything that comes into you is going to be income. But importantly, and why I put it in green, is what income can I create? Because when you understand the creation of income and the deductibility of expenses, and you're able to commercialize what's going on in your affairs, that's where efficiency really starts to come into gear. So we're going to look at what you can claim, what you can commercialize, and, and what, what we could be utilizing as individuals to make ourselves more optimal. This table is kind of the base table for today. So what I want to show you is four salary levels, 500,000, a million, 1.5, and 1.2. And when I talk about salary, I really talk about taxable income. So it's the sum total of what comes in to your, 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 your personal wealth and what will be taxed on in personal tax. And you can see that at the bottom, the effective tax rate on the different elements really is what, we, that's kind of the goal for us. So if you start off, if, you're, if you earn 500,000 and your effective tax rate is 25, and next year it's 24, and then it's 23, and you hover on 22, this is what a tax plan looks like. A tax plan looks like you effectively pay less tax every year, because the reality is these plans take time to manifest themselves, and there's a, quite a lot of elements that we're going to put into place. So I just want you to mentally freeze frame that image so that you know that without a plan, that's, you're always going to pay the maximum. So the return is simplistic, but you're going to pay the maximum. It's as simple as that. So as we move forward, bear that in mind, and I will refer to it again. I wanted to start with a very simple example that everyone can understand. So we're using exactly the same numbers, 500, 1 million, 1, 5, and 2 million. But this time, we've just added one layer, one little component, and we've put in 50,000 rands worth of interest. Now, by doing that, we're obviously dropping the other elements of taxable income, but the principle is to keep the total the same. And if you go straight to the bottom, I don't want you to be complicated by numbers. We, you, you will get a, a, a copy of the pack for yourself. But if you go straight to the bottom, just by converting some of your income to interest, activates the interest exemption, which you can see at the top there is 23,800. By maximizing that in your income, all of a sudden, your cash saving and your effective rate saving are in green at the bottom. Look at what we've done. We've implemented one small element of financial planning, and it's resulted in a more effective tax rate. It's also resulted in a cash saving. The story I like to tell is this. If I asked any of you right now to give me 10,000 Rand, I can virtually guarantee that every one of you would say no. But when I ask people, to do one small thing to save them 10,000 Rand, they don't understand the relationship. And everything we do in tax, planning at least, is linked to where the numbers go on the page. What component of the act are you going to attack? Probably not the right word, that's what SARS do. But the fact of the matter is, how do you want to make money? And it, as you go forward, we, as you go forward through today, you'll start to see that making money is one element of wealth, but retaining it is another. So let's go to the next slide and we start to sort of unpack that a little bit by little, but I hope this starts to give you an entry level context. Um, so when we talk about tax strategy, in, from a Burns Aikert perspective, tax really happens in February because on provisional tax, the calculation needs to be within 80 or 90% depending, meaning that you've already paid your tax as of February. That's the reality of the situation. So when you come to do your assessment in now, in October or September, uh, you're not really paying your tax. What you're doing is the calculation, the, you're wrapping it up. You should be paying a little, bit, a little bit in. What happens is people want big refunds, but what you're not understanding is by getting a big refund, it means you've overpaid previously. There's no such thing as a refund. There is only a repayment, and that's important. Now, you can't always get away from that. So some people have a, a simple uh, personal tax structure, meaning that they pay their PAYE through their employer and they get deductions and they get their refund. So that's fine. We can accept that. But other people don't tax plan 
and then they want a refund. And I'm saying, well, why would you prepay the government? It doesn't make sense. If you simply plan, this is not even on efficiency now, this is just on cash flow. If you simply plan your taxes better, you wouldn't have to prepay the government, then you wouldn't have to chase them for a refund, and you wouldn't have to go through an audit in order to get your refund. So that's kind of how we like to play in that space, is to be ahead of the game. And for most of our clients, that's certainly the case. I look at their tax comps now, and there's top-ups, there's small payments, but it's the guys that don't plan. That those are the ones I really want to try and get through to in a, in a, in a bigger way. Uh, so that's you know, a big part of the point of today. So the things we're going to talk about today, I want you to consider which ones you would like to apply to yourself and go and implement them so that by the time we get to Feb 21, you're in the game. And, and that's important because you reap what you sow. We all know that and tax is exactly the same thing. So the last point I wanted to make is that, and it's really demonstrated by this slide. In business and in tax, my belief is wholehearted that big wins are hard to accomplish. It's the small wins that matter. It's the aggregation of marginal gains. And there's your picture. That's the tax, tax office and the government want your money. This is the reality. And they think of it as their money. There's an entitlement that comes with uh, infrastructure, which, which is government, and they want their 40% or their 30%. The very first thing I remember learning in, in tax at Varsity on the very first day was there was a principle they taught us. And the principle was a man is entitled to arrange his affairs in his best possible interest. And that's over the years, this was more than 20 years ago, but over the years that, that principle has become constrained by modern thinking, which is that there is an entitlement to your money. But the principle I still believe exists. And so we, we operate on that basis. We try and put all your numbers in the right corner, in the right pocket. And it's not as complicated as you think. It just takes a little bit of, a little bit of attention from yourself, a little bit of guidance from someone like us, and all of a sudden, you start to see these benefits. And by the time we finish today, you're gonna to see what a detailed tax plan can look like. And it's hundreds of thousands of rands. That's the point. So we started off with 10,000, we're gonna finish in the hundreds of thousands. Somewhere in between, the majority of people can land. There is no reason for you not to make the choices as a taxpayer that will be in your best interest. The difference is knowledge and the willingness to do the administration. So now that I've got your interest, let me bore you quickly with the SARS process. Because again, working in South Africa in this space, it can be very frustrating. And I think one of the biggest frustrations clients have is they don't get feedback. They don't understand that SARS have long lead times. They lack competency in many areas and we are the ones chasing them. So let's look at why the process matters and let's get your head into the game of how to play this game. Firstly and most importantly is that the second you submit your tax return, that's when the SARS process begins. Now, if your tax return is consistent, meaning that there's not a lot of fluctuation in your overall income and expenditure, if it doesn't have verification elements and if it's not randomly selected for audit, that's it. You're not going to be audited. That's first prize for us as a firm. We have ex an extremely low number of audits because of this. We prepare everything that gets us ready for the audit. We know what they want to do. But what happens regularly, and this isn't an audit, and this is where we, we need to understand the terminology difference, is that there's a verification. So the verification, we prepare for that. It's why we are a little bit onerous and we need certain documents and we need this and we need that. But the second SARS ask for it, we upload it, we work with the SARS auditor, they, they understand it, and then it's over. So a verification is not an audit, it happens a lot, the majority of people get verified. Things like RAs are always verified, almost always. So additional medical, these things are always going to be verified. So having them nicely prepared in a pack that just enables SARS to take one look at them, and off they go. A little trick from my perspective is that if you want SARS to look into your things in detail, give them things they don't understand. Give them complex schedules. Give them paperwork that doesn't link. Then they're going to start digging into you. But if you want SARS to verify you and move on, then give them slick data. This makes the difference. And that's really what we're all about. So that's important. If the data is not slick, okay, this is where we start heading into assessments and audits. Assessments would be where they look at the data and they go, I don't buy it. You're not getting it and they raise an assessment of five grand or 10 grand or whatever the number is relative to what you put in front of them. 
that's not the worst thing in the world because generally they would be right. The documentation wouldn't be good enough. The reasoning wouldn't be good enough. You can pay the additional assessment and life goes on. We obviously try and avoid that, but it's not impossible that that can happen. But when it gets to SARS audits, now you're going into a long drawn out process that's going to take three months, six months, nine months of commitment. They're going to dig, they're going to ask more questions. They might start calling for things like bank accounts. They can do lifestyle audits. I mean, it's totally the opposite of where you want to be. And we do our absolute best to avoid this at all costs. I'm not sure at the moment, but I think we've got nothing at the moment in terms of major SARS audits. And that's a consequence of our processes. So you need to trust the process a little bit when you're with a firm like us. We're thorough on purpose. We're not perfect. The mistakes will happen. But fundamentally, if you follow the processes and if you be thorough with us, not only will you be optimal in terms of efficiency and cost, but you'll be protected from wasting your time having to explain yourself and then from being picked out. So, so that's important. Um, the way we finalize an audit with SARS is really just for them to say, look, we're happy. Generally, my view would be if the assessment is reasonable and it's not worth a big fight, we would accept it. But if it's obviously wrong and it's a significant amount of money, then we have to fight it. But fighting it is what takes the time. Because now you've got to go through levels of management at SARS. You may or may not end up in the courts. And all this while, you don't get your tax, your, 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 your tax refund because you're not going to get a refund until you're cleared. You're also going to owe the money that's on your statement of account unless we can get a, a suspension of payment. And you're not going to get a tax clearance. So the downside to not being prepared, I mean, it, it outweighs everything. It's almost as if our business is 99,9% .9 upside and 1% downside because we simply don't want to do this. You don't want to pay us to do all the work that's required to sort it out. You don't want SARS digging into your affairs. And if you really don't want these things, you've got to play the game. And that's the point of this section is to say we've got to play the game. So if we look at the timelines, this year they've done ridiculous timelines. I mean, we're supposed to process the whole country in or just about the whole country in three months. They pushed it out from July to September, but then they pushed it forward from December to November. So really only SARS can understand the logic of how they do that. I'm not overly concerned by the timelines, but I am aware of them. And I'm aware of them because as we all know, SARS are looking to generate additional revenue and being late is technically a penalty. So SARS are going to be implementing more and more penalties for, for non-compliance and non-submission. So anyone who doesn't have their affairs in order runs the risk of being nailed. Now, the way SARS have looked to implement it, and I say looked because of the, technically the day you're late, they can, they can raise the penalty, is they've looked to give a bit of a grace period in the past, but they seem to be shortening that period all the time. So it's something to bear in mind that these deadlines are to protect you because they will raise the penalty. And if they raise the penalty again, now we're in the objection, we're not going to win. So it's something for you to bear in mind. These timelines do matter. I wanted to take you through some, some rules of personal tax. I alluded to one of them earlier. But if we look at the picture, you know, it's one thing to make money. It's another thing to keep money. And it's really another thing entirely to give that money to the government. And so it's, it's important to understand what income is taxable. And I say all income is taxable. Now, technically, that's not correct. There are types of income that are exempt and can be excluded, but it's not going to help you to think like this. If you earn it, the government want their piece of the pie. That's the principle that if you apply, you will understand income. From an expense perspective, this is where the opportunity sits. So tax deductions are not linked to expenses incurred. You can't spend money and think it's a tax deduction. You have to spend money in production of income for it to be a tax deduction or in compliance with the Act. So that's very, very important. And how we make decisions as, as individuals who are in business and personal tax people is when you spend money is if you want to spend a thousand rand that's not tax deductible, you're spending a thousand rand. But if you spend your thousand rand and it's tax deductible, you're reducing your tax bill that by your marginal rate. I've used 41%, which is meaning that you're actually only spending five ninety. The SARS, through the nature of how it's designed, will subsidize your expenditure to the tune of their tax portion if that expenditure is valid. So this is important because as we learn these principles, we can go forward. Now, we did a, a, we did a, quick, graph, a quick graph for you still using the 50, uh, 500, 1 million, 1 1.5 and 2 million. And we just showed you the effective tax rate that different people are on and what that would look like. So really, this is the point. 
is when you want to spend money, you must understand if it's tax deductible or not. You know, as a business person, there's things that will never be tax deductible. So things like your kids' school fees, things like personal health, you know, makeup and deodorants and all these types of things. These are never going to be tax deductible. Real personal expenses. So you have to know that and live, live with that. But many other expenses that you incur are actually tax deductible if you link it. And I'm gonna start showing you how to link it now. So look at your tax tables, and this is also important. You know, when you work out your tax, you link to your tax table. And I want you to look at the first line because this is where a nice opportunity exists for the majority, and that's on the tax rate. People with spouses who don't work, people with major children who don't work yet and who are at varsity, you can start to pay these people to do services within your operation. And at 83,100, which is, you know, it's nearly seven, seven grand a month, I think, you, you can actually pay no tax. So if you took that number and the principles we've just been speaking about and said, well, if seven grand a month was at 40%, you'd be paying three grand a month in tax. But if you activate one of your relatives who can help you with your business, then you could actually save that three and a half grand a month in tax. And that's on the different marginal rates. So this becomes very important with, when you take a broader view of you, what you do and those around you and what they do. And then as we go through the tax tables, the goal is always to keep you on the minimum possible taxable income by managing your expenses. So how we do this and how we try and you know, add value to you, every single client has a detailed tax comparator. So I can see all the components in one sheet of your tax over the years. And we share that with you. So most of you would have seen it. That then tells us, A, what we need, because from a tax perspective, we need to be complete. So one of the things that happens often is people earn interest and they don't submit the interest certificates. But SARS picked that up. Now, the second SARS pick it up, A, it's the first flag, and B, potentially there's a penalty going to be raised because they're going to tax you on that. So that's why we actually have the comparative. It's to give us a strategic view of your position, your components, but also to protect you from omission, and especially omissions that SARS will pick up because they will penalize you. So that's an important document. I encourage you to all be familiar with that. Um, as you move through the year, things will change. So that document gets updated with your changes, and then we do an initial tax calculation. Now, the trouble I have with some guys is they don't understand that the initial calculation is literally the initial calculation. So when you see a big number, like 51,000 or whatever it might be, you can't be scared of the number. You need to understand the process. And the process is what we have so far, based on how you've always done things, gives us this number. If you don't like the number, the question is, well, what's missing? What do we not understand? Or what should you have planned better? How should you have made that number more manageable? Because we don't magically make numbers go away. It's not possible for us. And, and I think sometimes the misconception is that somehow we're going to reduce the tax. And that's really what I want to debunk today. We're not going to reduce the tax. We're going to calculate it, optimize it, and manage it. You have to reduce the tax. You have to have a tax strategy and a tax plan. We go back to the first slide. If your plan is to drop off the paper and hope for the best, that's not a plan. So today, if you take nothing else from today's talk, it's that we would like you to build a plan and build it slowly if necessary and build it over time. So that's what we do. We give you that initial assessment and then we ask you, are you comfortable? What are we missing? Share with us. You also need to bear in mind that a lot of annual tax clients we literally see once a year. So the, the ability for us to know what's happening in your life will come from you. It's why we value communication at such a high price in, in, in the firm because the ability to communicate empowers us to know what to do. So we talk to you, we understand the components, and once we're all on the same page, that's when we submit. I'm very lucky at Burns Acre, unlike many environments that I've seen, we have a dedicated resource following up SARS correspondence on a daily basis. And on a daily basis, we get hundreds of SARS correspondences. A lot of them are just information, but sometimes that's where the verifications come from. Sometimes that's where the audits come from. We watch that like hawks. So we miss very little in that space, and that protects you. And that's another layer of quality that you might not recognize as an obvious value add from being with a professional firm, but the, the inability to miss SARS communication is critical. So when you miss SARS communication, you go on to deadlines, it's more flags, and they look in detail. We're picking it up almost same day, we're addressing it almost immediately. These differences are what make the difference for you, the user. Our role 
And this is a big thing for me. And this is what I really want to get out there. Our role is to interpret, prepare, advise, help you optimize, be ahead of the game, know what's going on, complete your return, deal with SARS. But our role is not to be responsible for your tax. It's a ludicrous idea that someone else can be responsible for your tax. It's your life. It's your responsibility. So we encourage our clients and my favorite clients take their responsibility seriously. Because if you take it seriously, we can help you. That's really the point. If you don't take it seriously, there's a limit to what we can do. And seriously means, if you want me to define it, it means you know what's going on. Even if you don't understand it fully, you know where it comes from. You know what the documents look like. You know what each element can be and you choose around them. And the way you get there is by asking lots of questions. This is why our communications will constantly talk about ask questions. Let us know what you need. Book meetings. Talk to us. We cannot spoon feed you learning. Learning is an active process. You have to do it yourself. And that's the firm you're with. We want to teach you your taxes. We want to teach you all elements of your business. Not so that you can become experts, but so that you can fulfill your responsibility by having confidence that you've equipped yourself with information. So the documents that you need to prepare, and as much as they, they matter, it's literally the document that relates to the transaction. So it's bank statements, it's certificates, it's invoices, it's schedules. That's the document. The more formal the organization you're with, the easier it is to get the document. So for example, a bank, they will give you fantastic documentation. A medical aid, they will give you excellent documentation. But if you're a sole prop, for example, or if you have a side business, then the documentation sits on you. You've got to make sure the contractors are giving you an invoice. You've got to make sure that you understand that the tax invoice that you have is, will work as a deduction. So there's an element of understanding what do you really need to focus on and what will come to you. And I think that's quite useful. In terms of schedules, we'll help you build them. But really, a schedule is just listing income and expenditure and having the, back, and having the backup. Um, so there's a couple of things that you all know. I've mentioned them. The, the other one is the travel logbook. So the travel logbook is like a SARS number one. And the more the more the more the years go by, the more detail they want out of the logbook. So now we're at a point where we're saying buy those GPS things that list everywhere you've gone, or maintain the manual. But opening kilometers, closing kilometers, where did you go? How long did you go for? And the big thing SARS have started asking, why did you go there? As ridiculous as it is, because of course you can just say, went for a work meeting, new client, they literally want those answers now. So where we used to be able to submit a travel logbook with the travel details, now they want the explanation. Qualifying commission expenses are important. There's a lot of commission earners out there. And to me, commission and side business are closely linked. So that's, you're the types of people specifically who need to be spending additional time with us, making sure that every expense is captured. Now, the most common mistake people make is assuming that an expense is not business related. We look at it the direct opposite. We assume all expenses are business related and then we exclude because it's easier to take something out than put something in because you can't put it in, you don't know about it. So that's what we encourage clients to do is if you're not sure, put it in as a claim and then in the meeting with us, we'll say, no, that you can't claim. But give yourself the best possible chance of claiming the most expenses by having the most expenses available in the initial computation. The other one we see a lot of is people like giving money away, donations to charities and, and, to, and to good places. But if you, don't give a, if you don't get a Section 18A certificate, you don't get to claim the deduction. So you have to accept, if, you, if you're gonna donate money to someone who's not registered, it's not a tax deduction. If you want the tax deduction, then donate the money to someone who's registered. And the big area I wanna tackle this year and this is perfect for Feb 21, is home office expenses. Most of us are now working from home one way or another. Most of us are incurring costs. SARS have issued some guidance in terms of how they will uh, allow expenditure. The, 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 the month I'm using is three months that you worked at home for three months. But I see no reason why we can't set all our clients up as working from home permanently, even if that permanently means part time. What this is going to do is it's going to commercialize a significant amount of expenditure linked to the running of your home, home office, and create an incredible tax advantage for you. Now, the one disadvantage when you claim, not necessarily home office expenses, but certainly rental, is that your primary residence exclusion can be uh, compromised to a point, but we'll talk about it again later. But one of the principles in our firm is defer, defer, deferment first. 
So if you can pay tax later, pay it later. That's the game. We, ne we don't pay tax now to save tax later. It's nonsensical from a cash flow perspective. So that's something to think about. The tips and tricks I wanted to give you are just to make your life easier. So for example, medical expenses. Don't keep detailed schedules of all your medical expenses. It's not necessary. Submit all your medical expenses to the medical aid. They will then reflect what you paid as a one-liner on your certificate and SARS will accept that. So whilst you can keep all your slips, I must be careful how I say that, whilst you must keep all your slips and keep all your backup for all your medical expenses, having it processed through your medical aid, even if it's paid yourself, will just mean that you give SARS one document from the medical aid finished. If you don't do that, they're going to go through every slip and they're going to say, this doesn't apply. I can't read this slip. I'm not allowing this. You shoot yourself in the foot by not following a simple process of submitting all medical expenses to the medical aid. It's an easy trick. It makes a huge difference. From a travel perspective, we spoke about the detailed logbook. The other option is the reimbursive tax rate per kilometer because you don't need a logbook for that. You can just charge the 3 Rand 98 to a maximum of 12,000 business kilometers and you can be reimbursed. Now, they're quite distinct, so we won't get into it too much now, but the one is the allowance and the one is the reimbursement. And then retirement annuities. I'm going to show you just now why we think retirement annuities make sense. And of course, everyone will have their own socio-political view on those things. I'm not here to talk about politics. I'm here to talk about tax. So there's the nugget at the bottom. Deferral of tax beats payment. And the RA deduction fits squarely into this opportunity. Here, here is the RA deduction. So once again, using the, the numbers of 500, 1 million, 1.5 and 2 million for your remuneration, we can see the cash saving at the bottom of doing an RA is at the highest level at 2 million, it's 157,000 Rand. But what you need to understand about this, and I think this is the part that people miss when they say that RAs are risky. This is what you're missing. If I said to you right now, I will give you a 350,000 Rand investment in a unit trust, but I would only charge you 142,500 because I would reduce your tax by 157,500. I mean, think about it as a no brainer. You've got an investment for 350,000, but you're only paying 157,000 Rand less in cash. It's, that investment would have to capitulate before you lost money on the trade and or on the purchase or on the decision. So this is why RAs still make sense to me. The argument then becomes, but we'll pay tax in the future. You might pay the tax in 20 years time. The compound benefit of that 157,000 Rand over 20 years or more at a, at a return of six or 7%, whatever the markets are gonna deliver in this new world that we live in, I mean, it's just the, the maths of doing RAs from a tax planning perspective. It's really, it's, 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 it's more about cash flow. It's more about what you want to do with the rest of your money. But from a tax planning perspective, an RA is a no-brainer. So I'll leave the politics aside and leave that with you. We spoke about home office expenses, and, and that's important. So now we can define the production of your income differently because you're based at home or partially based at home. And your supporting documentation would be a lot of the expenses that you never used to claim. We've, we've got a little template that you can use to get started. But really, for me, it's more about a conversation than a template. The template is a start. The conversation is how do we put this forward? When I talk about personal assistance, I'm including staff that might help in your garden or around your house. I'm including your spouses. I'm including your children who are 16 or 18 and who can do uh, part-time or work to part-time work. These people, you need to find a way to commercialize them linked to your income. So the conversation you need to have is, how can we do that? And if you can pull that off, you saw earlier that the, the, the significance of tax saving that can come from activating the people around you. The personal favorite of mine is capital gains tax. So the majority of us have shares and have investments. If you simply sold 40,000 rands worth of profit in your share portfolio every year, you would pay no tax because every year the government gives us a 40 grand capital gains allowance. If we don't use it, we lose it. So very simply put, if I buy my shares for 100,000 and they're worth 140, if I don't sell them, the next year they're worth 200, the cost is still 100. So my capital gain is on the 100. 
But if I sell them at 140 and rebuy, the tax is zero. My new cost is 140. So when they go up to 200 and I sell them, well, I've made an 80 profit, a 60 profit, but I've got another 40 to, to take off. So I end up paying tax on 20 instead of pack tax on 100 by utilizing this clause. It's such an easy trick to do. It's all it requires is an investment in your own name, understanding what the gain is on the share and triggering it once a year for approximately 40,000. It's, it's literally free money if you know how, and I've just told you how. So it's that easy, but you get the point. You have to do it. You have to actively go, sell the share, make the profit, and off you go. And, and don't make profits and losses. It's not going to help. You want a clear profit of 40 grand minimum to use this. We talked about donations. I've alluded to spousal efficiency more than once. The other one I like is the tax-free savings account. Because once again, over time, you're going to have up to 500,000 rand earning an income that's not taxable. Now, if we go back to our old rates of 10%, that means you'd be earning 50,000 uh, 50, rand a year and not paying any tax on it. I mean, if you're at a 40% marginal rate, you're saving 20 grand. But where this really kicks in is with your children. If you build your children a tax-free savings account from birth and they only cash it in when they're 60 or 65, they use it as a retirement mechanism, that will literally spend nearly 60 years earning income without tax. And that's multi-million rand type stuff. Now, there's lots of principles that go around that. Of course, as soon as you sell it, you, you lose it, markets. But you get the principle that this is what planning looks like. It's an active process. And when you take it to your kids, you, you've got a multi-generational time frame to benefit from a one structural choice, provided they don't derail you. So that's important. Another thing I want to talk about is multiple payrolls. I've got a slide, so I'll, I'll rather explain it to you there. But a lot of you earn money from two bosses. You have two jobs, you work for two companies, and you run two payrolls. And you keep making the same mistake. So that, that's important. That's a big, uh, a big tip not to make the same mistake. Then when I talk about channeling income into wealth structures, that's very complicated. But what I really want to say to you in a simplistic way is that not all money has to be earned in your own name. You can set up entities and structures around you that are part of your wealth plan, that are part of your estate plan, that provide a commercial difference, which is critical from a SARS perspective, to have that commercial difference. And then that commercial difference will allow you to save. And some of the, some of the structures we use, the saving is as much as 20%. So you can imagine, if you're talking about a million rands income, 20% becomes 200,000 rand in tax efficiency every year. And we start to see how this can compound as we play this game more and more and more and more. And then of course, the interest exemption we've spoken about and you know, our suggestion is use it. One of the areas you can use it is via loan accounts in companies. So a lot of us have companies, property companies, small PTYs, CCs that are loan accounts. We don't, um, we, we don't necessarily wanna charge interest for whatever reason, but if we do charge interest and we earn under the threshold, what we're doing is we're creating a tax-free draw, uh, additional drawing out of our loan account. And of course, we're utilizing our interest exemption. That's, that, that, that example of, of building your loan account through interest and taking your interest exemption if you don't store cash is very similar to the 40 grand CGT saving. It's playing a game within the rules, within the numbers, and building up your tax-free money. This is how we do it. So I think that that's quite an important little tip for you guys you know, to consider as you, as you go forward. Just a side note, pretty relevant this year, TAR, uh, TERS payments from SARS are not taxable. So they don't fall into your tax comp. It was just kind of like the once off bonus from government that you'll never get again. So you've got it, you've won it, and we don't have to do anything. This year I wanna show you, because a lot of you guys have your own businesses and you, you don't know how to set your salaries. And it's really so simple. So I'll spend a little bit of time on this in the hope that a lot of you will get benefit. But you've all heard of dividends, and it's very simple. The number at the top is the dividend number, the dividend differential. So you do not declare dividends as an individual business owner until your salary exceeds 1577. And by salary, I mean taxable income. And by taxable income, I mean yours and your spouses and your majors. So dividends are ineffective below 
1577 and effective above 1577. That's the dividend differential. That's literally all you have to do to know how to set a dividend. Once your earnings go above, it's dividend. Once they're below, it's bonus. And we do this for our monthly clients by default. So the majority of you should be in good hands, but it's useful for you to understand that that's how simple it is. And the difference in saving, if you look at the bottom, on every 100,000 Rand that you earn, it's 2,600 Rand. So let's, do, let's go back to my earlier example. If I asked you for 2,600 Rand right now, would you give it to me? And the answer is no. But if I said to you, just change your salary by 100,000 Rand and change your dividend by 100,000 Rand, and it would make you 2,600 Rand, a lot of people say, it's not worth the effort. And I'm going, it's bizarre. If it's not worth the effort, just give me 2,600 Rand, double up on your position, I'll be happy because I'll have 2,600 Rand, and you don't care. And the truth is no one ever wants to do that because you do care. And that's what caring looks like in the dividend space. Caring looks like knowing exactly what your salary needs to be and taking it from there. Now, I spoke earlier about those of you who are on multiple payrolls. And this is the mistake you make being on multiple payrolls. You think that somehow your tax is paid. But this, this slide shows you that your tax is not paid. Because when you run a payroll, the payroll system, there's no artificial intelligence. We're not in 2030 yet. The way our government's going, we might never have actual intelligence, but you don't know whether it's going to be artificial or not that takes us across the line. But the point is, if you pay yourself 250,000 Rand twice through two payrolls, you're essentially going to be processing two sets of rebates. So when you do your tax return at the end of the year, you're going to have this massive bill of 43,000 Rand. And the argument's going to be, but I've paid my tax. And the explanation's going to be, but you've claimed your rebate twice. These are the frustrations that are not necessary for you to have, because if you understand them, you can either not claim the rebate on one of, on one of the uh, payrolls, or you can top up on the provisional process, meaning that on assessment, you won't get a big bill. So I hope you understand for those of you that have two payrolls and two income streams that you can. So I think Brad, are you back, Brad? Have I frozen? Yes, so we lost you when you were talking about having two income streams, and I think just highlighting the importance of making sure that the tax deduction is correct on each payroll to make sure that you don't end up with a big tax bill on assessments. There's nothing worse than having a moment on a webinar because I have no idea what you learned, and it's such an important section that I can only hope that you picked it up. So I'm going to repeat it, and I apologize for that. But the point is this. If you have two payrolls, you're claiming two sets of rebates, and that's why you end up getting a big tax bill. So either one of the payrolls mustn't claim the rebate, or you must pay in your provisional tax the difference so that on assessment, you don't get the, 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 the big bill. But remember, on assessment, if you get a big bill, it's probably going to include a penalty. Because if you don't estimate correctly in February, they penalize you on assessment. So this is very important. There's a lot of you who fall into this category, and I really want you to take from today that if you fall into this category, come and chat to us and have confidence. So if you earn 2 million Rand, you can have 285,000 Rand without trying very hard in tax reduction, because that's what the green number is. That's less tax that you've paid. If you earn 500,000 Rand, you can have 94,000 Rand in tax savings, just by having a plan, by ticking the boxes, by playing the game. And if you look at the boxes I've put in there, I've put that 40 grand capital gain because you've got to do that. I put the maximum RA in because that's the maximum value. I put the spousal salary in, but I haven't equalized it. So there's significant upside available on that line if you're in the 2 million rand range or the 1.5 million rand range. The home office expenses are put in at 25 grand. I think we can take that further and further forward as we get to grips with what it costs you to run your business from home. And I've even put in some donations. So now you start to see, you know, the guy with a great plan, this guy might have 30,000 Rand a month or 8,000 Rand a month in tax efficiency, but you just don't have if you don't have a plan. This is the point of today's conversation. It's not to give you the answers, it's to set you in the direction to start looking at this differently. Because if you're not interested as a taxpayer in paying 7% less or 4% less tax or 3% less tax, which is the equivalent of 10, 20, or 30,000 Rand a month. I mean, then you shouldn't have tax planning. You should just 
you should just, you know, work wherever you want to work and pay the government as much as possible. But if you are what we think you are, which is clients of Burns ACAT and wanting to pay less tax, this is how you do it. So that's important. So I won't confuse you on that slide, but look at it, look at it. It really boils down to this. We have five apples and SARS want six, and that's what it feels like. By the time you've paid your bills and paid your bond and paid your water and lights, and you know, for some of you might not know this, but the effective tax rate in South Africa, when you add up all the taxes, it's somewhere around that 70% mark. 70% is a lot of money to give a government who are ineffective. And we can't do anything about that because it's legislated. We're not criminals, we're not corrupt, that's not our game. So we have to be academic. This is the way we have to play the game. We've got to be academic, we've got to get ahead of them, and we've got to reduce our tax bill through structure and planning. So that, from a timing perspective, actually went quite well. I hope that some of you have got some questions. Um, so I'll hand it back to Al and, and Vashana and him will, will sort of facilitate the Q&A. But I hope that that helps. I never know whether you get as much value as I'm trying to impart, but certainly it felt like if the information made sense to you, that you should be in a slightly better position to start your strategic plan, assuming you haven't already done so. So I hope that's the case and I hope you enjoyed listening to personal tax. I know it's not as exciting as rugby and Borovos and coronavirus and all these other topics, but we do have to do it. So thank you. Magic, Brad, thank you very much. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna open the floor for some Q&A. Um, uh, Tammy, who's running our admin board, will give everybody the ability to unmute themselves. Um, if you do have a question, please feel free to ask. Um, so I think let's, let's open up the floor now for if there are any current questions that, that you would like to ask, ask Brad. I think let's fire away. Vishana, do you have any questions from the um, from the chat that's come up? Um, unfortunately, I don't see anybody asking questions. Perhaps you have them and you want to ask them at a later stage. Um, but I believe Lisa, she has a question that she'd like to ask. Lisa, can you go ahead? Hey, thanks, um, Vishana. Um, I was just wondering, I have pretty much just an RP5 for my tax, maybe some rental income, but I I make contributions to a retirement annuity fund and medical aid contributions. So why don't I receive a refund? So Vishana, do you want to answer that one? Well, that's a very good question. So your retirement annuity contributions and your medical aid contributions are a function of deductions. These are taken into account. If you would look at your IRP5, you would see under the deductions under code 4005, and under code 4001 or 4003, these are taken into account in calculating your monthly PAYE. So as much as you don't get a refund come assessment period, you are actually getting a monthly benefit in the form of a reduction in a PAYE and a higher gross income, uh, net income basically. So that's the reason why. That's very good. Another, another question has actually come through to me now. Um, under what circumstances do you need to keep a logbook? So, if you claim a travel allowance, you have to keep a logbook. That's the deal. So if you're going to try and get that travel allowance in your pay slip, you've got to keep your logbook. But if you do the reimburse of travel, you have to document what you're being re re reimbursed for. So it's almost the same as a logbook. It's kilometers, client, etc. But basically, the allowance is the reason to keep the logbook. Um, just to add to that, there's also um, taxpayers who earn commission income and obviously they incur business travel in production of their commission income. So I, we would also suggest that if you are claiming a travel mileage um, and petrol, motor vehicle expenses, etc. for commission uh, income, then please keep a logbook so that we can claim your actual expenditure in the portion of your business to total mileage. Um, I believe that we have a question from Charlene. Uh, yeah, um, so I believe that the, the tax threshold is around 500,000 rand a year. Um, uh, if I earn less than that, do I still have to submit a tax return or is it acceptable to just carry on without a tax return? 
But the way that SARS work now is you always have to submit a tax return unless you're under, underneath the minimum threshold. But what they've done now is they've got auto assessments for people who have simple tax returns. So for example, someone who earns one salary, no deductions, nothing else, you'll be auto assessed. Um, so my view would always be ask, if you're not sure, ask. Get someone to look at your tax profile, get someone to look at the status of your return, look at the components. But because of automation, the simpler your return, the lower the need to have it checked. Just be very careful around auto assessments. We noted that probably around 60% of auto assessments were incorrect in the favor of SARS, meaning that clients would have lost X amount in terms of deductions. So you've got to be really careful on the auto assessment side. So I think if you earn money, you're going to pay tax. And if you earn enough money, which really in my mind is probably anywhere from 20 grand a month, you know, maybe even less, just let someone look at it because it doesn't matter how little you earn. I think this is the fundamental problem with not only tax planning, but wealth management. It's not how little, it's not how little you make, it's how much you keep. So if you earn 20 grand and you keep 500 grand a month and you put it into an RA, well, you're up and running. You, you, yeah, you're up and running. You're getting a deduction, you're going. And slowly you're going to have interest and slowly you're going to do your thing. The, the point really is take your taxes seriously because the government do. It doesn't matter if you're a big earner or a small earner. I've never seen them focus more on the higher earners and not the lower earners. They focus on everyone. They want it. They want every cent from everybody that they can get. So by default, you should want to keep every cent that you can that you've made. So that would be my view. Um, someone has just shared with me that um, if you, in an earlier example, if you use the average rate instead of the marginal rate on savings, the benefit's greater. And that's a great point. Thank you for that. And that's, you know, that's, exactly, that, that's exactly what we're trying to say, is that you can save money and the calculation can be done in so many ways, but they're all in your favor. The, the next question I've got is, if you earn less than 500,000, you need to submit expenses. You always need to submit your expenses. So if, if you have deductible expenses, so you, have to, you have to try and think of tax as taxable income so by, by definition, taxable income is income minus expenses. Whereas the traditional thinking is that income is income and expenses are expenses. But taxable income is the net. So it doesn't matter what you earn. It matters how much you can claim that enables you to minimize your taxable income. So we, and, and you've got to have backup. So you, you want to be spending, again, I just think in terms of bank statements. You want to be spending as much money off that bank statement into the column that is deductible. And that's how you reduce your tax, especially as commission earners, sole traders, you know, people who aren't on PAYE or people who aren't in formal salary, which is many of our clients, because you're the ones that have the greatest opportunity to manage your taxes. So I hope that answers your question, but you always need to keep back up. Brad, can I ask a quick question? Can you hear me? Yes, of course. All right, my name's Chris. Hello, everybody. Hello, Alan. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> Good. Um, a quick thing. Um, I am self-employed. I'm a freelancer. I'm a writer. So I work from home. I'm just interested to know if there is sort of a basic list of things. I, 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 I likewise, before I started a business 20 years ago, I'm now out of that business and I'm a midlife student. Um, but working from home and I'm beginning to do sort of a few freelance jobs I've been sharing with Alan and those are going to pick up. So Chris, the, the at home expenses that you can, you can list that one should be, you know, every, every month they're putting stuff into a file. What are stuff that's, you know, sort of, boy, am I, have you lost me? No, my, my, my line, uh, you lost me? Uh, okay. Um, I think I'm still here, Chris. So, Chris, okay. the, we're, we're together. So, 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 basically, my question is: What are just the, the basic expenses that you can you should be collecting working from home? What are those? So, so let me tell you a story that'll help you understand that. So, mm. every expense that's related to the cost of what you're doing. So, for example, okay. if you have people come and visit you, you can mm. claim from a rental perspective. Um, you can claim part of the driveway, because that's used for business, part of the kitchen, because it's used for business, part of the lounge. So all the costs that are associated with these areas of the house, yeah. you can start to link them in. Part of your insurance, part of your maid, part of your DSTV if you use Bloomberg, part of your cleaning materials. So you might not be able to claim everything, but we build schedules to say, well, if 40% is the number, well, then I'm going to claim 40% of almost everything. 
part of your meals, if you're entertaining people, part of your teas and coffees. And these things add up sure. so quickly. They can be 2,000 sure. a month, 3,000 a month. Sure. Over a year, that's 36 or 40 grand. You know, okay. every, every okay. So I would say, again, I don't know if you remember me re referencing it. Put everything you can into your claim. Everything sure. that you think has even got the slightest chance, put it in. And we will then say to you, okay, let's either pro rata it, so use the 40% guide, or yeah. let's exclude it entirely. But I don't want you to limit your thinking in what's claimable. Because if you really had to think about it, there's very little money that we spend when we work from home that's not linked to us earning money. It doesn't matter whether it's communications money, cell phones money, telecom. I mean, it's, it's just all part of running our business. And that's what I, when I talk about being tax aggressive, that's what I'm talking about. I'm taking an aggressive view of which costs are supporting my income. And I'm backing that view with documentation and I'm submitting it to SARS and I'm prepared to fight about it. So, so, so you, you, the, 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 the approach is sort of think like a business with overheads and expenses and you, you just assume yourself to be operating like a business really, yeah. So Chris, you're not like a business, you are a business. You're a, you're a type of business no, 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 sure. called sole proprietor. So you apply this. You know, if, you, if you go to Unilever's boardroom, they'll be giving out lunches and fruits to guests. So why can't you as a sole prop? And that's, that's the argument I make. And, and I, I mean, this is what I'm most passionate about is claiming expenses. And I'm saying, but you can't have, you can't have one rule for Unilever and one rule for me just because I'm smaller. If that food is acceptable, then it's acceptable to me. Um, so okay. gotcha. the, the next question is also a very good question. It says, if, if you use a family member as a staff member, do you need to pay this, the money into their bank account? Or can you just justify their function? So on a very technical level, you don't have to physically pay the money into their bank account. My preference is that you pay the money into their bank account because it just gives you another layer that's linked to the pay slip that makes the arguments so much stronger. And that to me is a great way of, of, of commercializing your relatives. And, and they, they have to play a role in the production of income. You can't just pay them. But you know, that role could be uh, advisory. It could be administrative. You just have to get your family to work with you in terms of understanding how they can help be a part of the business, which has a, there's a rule in tax that says you can never do anything for the reason of saving tax. So you can never say, I'm going to employ you to save tax. What you do is you say, I'm going to employ you to help me handle the filing and I'm going to pay you 5,000 rand a month. Then you can claim the tax. So it's how you, it's how you position it that matters. And that's what you've got to watch. Sorry, Brad, just, just a quick one on that. I think um, it, it goes back to the point you made on documentation and providing layers of documentation. And something that we're finding is a lot of people are coming back and saying, okay, I'm doing my 2020 tax return. What expenses can I claim? We say, well, what do you have documentation for? No, well, I had this that I paid. I said, well, do you have an invoice? No, but I'm sure I can get an invoice. It's, it's about maintaining documentation. And remember, SARS compliance is all about documentation. And that's why the Burns Aked process works so well because you provide us with your information, we make sure we have the supporting documentation, we know what is expected of, of the taxpayer from SARS. If we feel there's an additional layer required, we will request that additional layer. And once we're armed with all that information, only then do we go and submit the return so that you don't go to an audit, you might go to verification, but you have the different layers of documentation which support your claim. And that's the main thing. And, and to Chris's point, Chris, put everything in, we will go through and see what needs to be excluded. As long as you have documentation to support the validity of the claim, then we're good. But it's all about documentation. I've got another question is, do, do people who are under 16 have to do tax returns? So the, the rule on a tax return is not linked to your age, it's linked to your income. So I, 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 Vashon, I'm not sure if you, if you can say what the, what the income level is where you do a tax return. Mm -hmm. But I think it's around about that 80,000 Rand mark. Mm -hmm. That's what I have in mind. So anything under that, you don't do a tax return. But you must remember there's a difference between earning underneath the threshold through a payroll and earning it privately. So you just have to watch that difference. But I use the number of 80,000 as a guide. So if you want to triple check that, you can reach out to us separately. But under 80, I generally don't think a, a tax return is necessary the exact figure for you. Um, yes, so basically
Basically, 83,100 is a threshold. If you're earning that much, then your taxes charged on that income basically equates to the rebates. So effectively, there would be no tax payable. Um, if we have some time, uh, we have a question from Sandy. Uh, Sandy, can you please go ahead? Uh, thanks, Vashana. So my question is that I've already submitted my tax and I have not been selected for verification, but I have a, a refund due to me. But why haven't they paid it? So that's a good question. We get that we get that one a lot. So your refund will be linked to your bank details. So SARS, sometimes they want to do bank detail verification. So if you don't get your refund in three days, especially the new SARS, the new SARS is much better. Um, if you don't get your refund in three days, it's almost always linked to your bank details not being verified. Uh, we now have a process that you used, you used to have to go in manually and verify, which was quite a, a schlep, but we now are able to do more of them um, electronically. They've improved that. So that's, if you don't get your refund, reach out to us, we'll check. If we're not sure, we'll do a bank re a verification. If the bank verification doesn't work, then we need to dig into the detail, because uh, there's got to be a reason. But 99% of the time, once your bank details are verified, you'll get paid. Brad, Ellen, hi guys. I just wanted to, without just uh, disappearing, just to say thank you. Thank you for this presentation. It's quite, quite insightful. And I'm, um, I've got, got a lot of info out of it. So thank you. And I'll be in touch soon. Pleasure, Alan. Good to you. Thank you very and much, Chris. Thanks. I think if there's, if there's no other questions, I mean, we can, we can do one or two last questions, but I, I guess everyone's got busy days. Yeah. Um, so if, if there are one or two last questions, let me just pause first before we close out. I think we're good. So, Al, I think you can wrap it up. And just from my side, thanks, everyone. I, I, I take... I take uh, Alan's feedback to be the one man that heard and learned something, but I hope it was more than one. And uh, yeah, certainly if you want to reach out to me or anyone else on the back of this, the, the point really of today isn't to equip you to say, right, let's get the ball going. Let's, let's, get you, uh, let, let's get you talking, let's get you thinking, and let's, it takes two or three years. But you know, I was with a very big client the other day and, and he was fortunate that he earns a lot of money. And we put a strategy in a couple of years ago that was gonna take a couple of years to manifest. And it's, it's now manifesting. And he's now seeing, you know, we're talking significant amounts of reductions in his tax payable. And it's those moments when the individual sees for the first time that not only does the strategy exist and make sense, but the tangible output is that your tax bill starts dropping substantially as a result of these choices. Those are the moments that make me happy because those are the moments that when I can see in their eyes that they get it and they get all the work and effort that gets put into the process and explaining it has a payout. So that's what we want to encourage you to do. Start that process, maximize your own understanding, and, and we take it from there. Magic, Brad, thank you very much. Um, everybody, will, will, everybody who was on this call will make a copy of this presentation available. We'll send it out to you by email. Um, like I said before, the, this webinar has been recorded. So if you want a copy of the recording, please feel free to reach out but also interact with us. So like I said, if you've got a BA manager that's part of your tax planning, uh, please feel free to reach out to them. Otherwise you can send Bradley or myself um, or Vashana an email directly and um, we'll, we'll be glad to engage. So thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to, to hearing from you and all the best with your 2020 filings and your 2021 tax plan. We, we're here to support you. Please reach out if you need us. Thanks, Al. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.